A very good evening and thank you for joining us this Sunday evening. My name is Josephine Karunji and we're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center Nile Room. Tonight we continue our discussion on drugs, addiction and uh, drug use. Let me introduce my guest for tonight. We'll just get into the conversation. Um, Dr. Kalema, who is starting, uh, sitting right next to me, he is an uh, addiction care specialist, executive director of Hope and Beyond Alcohol and Drugs Rehabilitation Center, and he has been involved in the treatment of alcohol and substance use disorders for over 12 years. Good evening, viewers. Right, great. Yeah. And right next to him is Murunji Ann Marion, who is a clinical pharmacist. Welcome, Marion. Thanks for having me. All right. And finally, we have uh, Poso Kiria, who uh, is a former drug trafficker. He was dealing drugs between 1998 and 2000. He was both using and trafficking. Welcome to the program. Good evening to yours. You're welcome. All right, great. Well, let's say it as it is. Mm. It's brought to you by Sparkle Saloon. Professional, affordable, and quality services. Well, so last, last week on, on the show, we had um, two people who shared their stories of, of addiction and use with us. Um, I'd like to start us off uh, with you, Doc, uh, Poso Kiria, with um, you were a drug trafficker. Yes, I was. How did that start? Uh, it was a peer influence that is still early in the, in the 90s when I was still in Amasagali College as a, as a student. Uh, I got into a clique of students and some of them were Nigerians that got involved into drugs. And uh, the, the way they were living their lifestyle at school, so I got influenced and I wanted to know more, so I got involved into drugs. So you, you'd seen the drugs before, so they told you this is what I was doing, would you like to join us? What exactly happened? Actually, it was courage that time. It was it's only to transport and bring it, but not taking it at that time, because most of them were just traffickers. Uh, they were okay. traffickers. And that time, I was of, of a good height, uh, nice looking, <laughs> and they said, no, you can make it at the airports. Nobody's going to bother you. We have been doing it, so we're going to train you how we're going to do it. What was your first journey? My first journey was to India. What were you carrying? I was carrying what we call uh, heroin, but it's cocoa brown. It is a, it's a brown substance. Okay. How also, it's a derivative of uh, opium. How did that go? How did you feel carrying it? Were you scared? What, what was going through your mind? It was, uh, it was a scary experience, but I looked much on the benefits at that time as a youth. Okay. You were arrested um, in Pakistan and in yes. Holland. Were you arrested in, I, I don't know if I got it right, were you arrested in China as well or you missed no, getting arrested? No, I missed it in China, but in Pakistan. That was in 2001. Pakistan carries the death penalty for this. How did you survive? It doesn't carry. It depends on the capacity or the quantity you carry. So you were carrying less than? I was carrying less than what is required for a death penalty. So what happened? I moved all the way from Lahore because uh, the airports in India had started to become a little bit tough. But Pakistan was an open corridor during that time. So. I went to Pakistan and as I was coming out, it was at all that easy for me. I was apprehended in Karachi and I, I stayed in that region up to 2004. So that was how many years? Uh, I spent 30 months. 30 confinement, months? Confinement, yeah, 30 okay. months. That's close to three years? That goes to two years two and a half. and a half, years, yes. okay. Okay, well, um, you mentioned you were carrying heroin at some point, and I, I, I wanted to ask the two specialists in your different fields, what are the hardest drugs to get over for a user? Yeah, I, I think uh, once a person has uh, come to the level of dependency, uh, every drug is very difficult to overcome. Uh, because we say alcohol is one of the drugs being used, I would say it's easier to overcome alcohol than uh, um, those uh, other drugs. Heroin, cocaine particularly, those are really very difficult drugs to, to overcome. To overcome. Yes. How, how does yeah. somebody get that addicted to them? Well, um, addiction is 
it depends on the type of drug that you're taking. Not all drugs have addiction potential, so it depends on the particular drug and how it works in your body. In particular, these drugs that uh, people get addicted to, they excite the reward centers of the brain. These centers of the brain are the ones responsible for laughter, pleasure, all those things that make you feel good. So when you take them and you get that reward, you definitely want to do that some more. You want to experience that again. So yeah, and the more you do it, like you said, you get to a place where you're dependent on them. And once you're dependent, then you get to a level where you're tolerant and then addicted. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So basically, at the level of addiction uh, you, uh, and dependency, uh, you cannot do without the drugs, and you cannot function normally without the drugs. So it becomes that uh, for you to eat, to sleep, or to even do your own uh, uh, professional duties, you have to <laughs> depend on, on those drugs. Okay. Yeah. Well, Apostle Kiria, you, you were bringing the drugs into the country. Yes. Right. So you had people who you were supplying and then they were, they were not the end user, were they? Most of them were not the end users because they were a little bit expensive. So it was working as a transit country, but some of them remained in the country for some users. What was your turning point to, I can't do this anymore? My turning point came in uh, around 2007. I just left Holland when I, I was there, held up for 10 months. Because before, uh, the government of Netherlands could uh, apprehend and uh, they take the drugs out of you and then they let you go. Because most of the jails were full during that time, within that period of time. So they, they developed a mechanism whereby they apprehend you, they remove the drugs, they let you go. That was their system they were using. Then it reached a time with a great opposition within their nations, and they said, no, that will encourage pushers because they wouldn't mind about the imprisonment. So I was confined there. So as soon as I, I was deported back here to Uganda, I said I can't do this anymore because I wasn't getting whatever I desired to get. OK, so when, when you say, I'm, I'm, I want to ask where the drugs were <laughs> getting, who they were getting them out of you from, but I, I might encourage somebody to oh. know where to. What was the biggest fear for you as a trafficker? My biggest fear was, was being apprehended. Which happened? Which obviously happened twice. And I realized that I, I'm losing my objectives. I couldn't continue doing that. And I, my, my future was vanishing away. So how did you survive in China? Uh, China, I left here and then I went. Uh, as soon as I reached the airport, I, we were like three, four at that time. And out of the three people, I was the only one who survived. I, I just got resilient. But I don't know, it was a God's making because uh, the man who was in charge, the two succumbed and they took to them then, but me, I refused. I said, I'm not going anywhere. Neither am I going for x-ray or for any checkup until, until you address my embassy to come. So we continued on that battle for almost two hours. Then all of a sudden there was a call. They made a call to the gentleman and they told him that somebody was very sick at home. So he diverted his attention to go and tend over his family. And then he told me, your God has helped you. If you ever come back here, you will never go back. Do you know what happened to the other two gentlemen? Uh, the other two gentlemen, I perceive they are still there. In China? They are still there in China. In prison? They are still there in prison. What, what exactly was your role? So you just bring the drugs into the country and give them to? That time I was, I was moving from Thailand, actually. I was moving from Thailand because most of the countries were so hard. So they will push it to Thailand, and then we pick it from Thailand into the inland China. OK. Well, so for, y for you guys, w if I know a friend or s a family member who is using drugs, they're addicted, how do I get them into rehabilitation? Do, do, how do I convince them to go? Does it ever come to a point where I just have to bundle them up, tie them up, and bring them and dump them there? Does that also work? Yeah, from, from my experience uh, of working with uh, people with substance use disorders, um, I find it that uh, majority uh, 
do not, uh, uh, are not willing to receive treatment. Because like uh, my colleague here said, addiction uh, is at a point of, uh, of reward, of, of pleasure. So many times people feel a lot of pain to sacrifice uh, this pleasure and they don't know they have a problem. Uh, everyone around them will, will think they will see they have a problem. Their family members, their colleagues will see they have a problem, but they do not admit they have a problem. It's only about 5% that, that will really uh, to walk themselves to a rehab. So if I so have this person times, who is not yeah, going to walk yeah, themselves yeah. there, how do I so do it? Ma many times you have to persuade them, but uh, when that does not work, then you have to work with the professionals. People in these uh, addiction treatment centers, they know how to go about that. Uh, there are times, uh, like at our place, they have many of them are brought uh, with escort of police, with support of police. Uh, but with time, after working the program, then they start really appreciating why, why they were brought in. So you doesn't have to be diplomatic all the time or it doesn't have to be voluntary all the time. Addiction treatment is not necessarily voluntary. Okay. Yeah. And just <coughs> to add to what you're saying, I mean, you have to realize that addiction is a compulsive behavior. They don't really want to do it sometimes, but they have, once they're off the drug, they have this compulsive need. They would do anything. They would sell a kidney even just mm. to get the drug. So you have, it's very important, first of all, to arrest addiction very early. If you recognize the signs and you know something is not right, this is not the way this person usually behaves, then it's very important to take that person through the proper channels, take them for counseling or maybe get a trusted friend or colleague or, fr or sibling to talk to them and see. And if that doesn't work, because like he said, it has levels. There is a point where you need to seek professional help, even use pharmacological you know, treatments to sort of put them under and maybe withdraw them carefully so that they don't go through the kind of withdrawal symptoms that would even kill them. Okay. So addictive is very, very compulsive. Well, you said, you mentioned selling a kidney and I, I, I'm curious, uh, Apostle Kiria, you were using at a certain point. Yeah, I was using heroin at a certain point. Uh, did you ever get to an extreme? What was your extreme? My extreme is that I, uh, I reached where I couldn't function well without it. I would shiver a lot, I would sweat a lot, I would stop everything, it would be a blackout. So at every moment I could move with it and it was, I was addicted that I didn't even need to have a watch. The drug itself became a, a, a watch, a timekeeper. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Because uh, the doses of heroin I was taking uh, they would last for four hours. Oh. As soon as four hours have elapsed, I needed another dose. Whether it was midnight or day or night, and that kind of addiction can keep you in one location, you can end up being unproductive because you must, you stay where, where the source is. So you were your own source actually? I wasn't my own source, but uh, Whenever I could have the ability, there were other sources within the town here. The people were selling locally because there are so many addicts that are here. How, how big is, is the drug addiction problem in Uganda? It's, it's, it's a growing concern. Uh, if you look at Uganda today and Uganda 10 years back, obviously, uh, we have more people with <coughs> addiction-related problems. Uh, I started uh, working with a people with substance use disorders 12 years back. Then the majority were uh, uh, people using alcohol and nicotine. And um, many of them were in a, like uh, their advanced age. The, the ones that are retiring or that have already retired 50 years plus. Uh, of recent, we have more and more young people in our rehabs especially they are using um, heroin, like he said, they are using cocaine, but the heroin they are using is also synthetic heroin, is kind of fake heroin, because the real heroin is very expensive. They couldn't afford yeah, it. Yeah, they m very few can afford. So, but the heroin they are using now that they can get at about uh, 5,000, 7,000 a short. Well, let's not give them ideas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> okay. so, so, just so, to, just to yeah, cut you yeah. uh, short, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kalima, let's mm -hmm. take a short break and, and we'll continue right after. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room, and we're talking drugs and addiction. Yeah. You were explaining yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the magnitude of the yeah, problem the in Uganda. Yes, and I was comparing it with how it was 10 years back. Yeah. And I was saying that these days we have more young people using drugs and more young people in rehabs as compared to how it was in the past. And I was attributing that to availability of these drugs at really low cost. And I was saying that these days, the drug uh, dealers and makers have devised different ways of making these uh, drugs accessible to, to our young population. Do we have figures that um, show the magnitude? That shows the magnitude. Unfortunately, yeah. we have not yet conducted research in this area. I, c I can only talk about alcohol because from a, a service provider's point of view, alcohol is considered a drug. So I can tell you that about uh, 4 million Ugandans have uh, alcohol use disorders. But when it, comes to, when it comes to drugs like heroin, cocaine, and all that, we need to, we need to, to involve in, a, in a surveys to find out the accurate figures. All I can tell you now is that 60% of our clients in the rehabs are on drugs, on these hardcore drugs. And they are younger generation, so uh, yes, between uh, uh, 15 yeah. to? Between 18 to 25. 18 majority to 25. Between 18 to 25, yes. Okay. Yes. Are they, um, so I, I wanted to ask, and this was, this was for you, I, for some reason in my head it was about dealers and supplying, which age groups do you, would, would they supply to? Would you, would you have that information? Majority of them are between the age of 17 up to the age of 40. Up to the age of 40? Yeah, majority. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are very clever because they know, like Uganda is a young nation, so they always want to target uh, the, young, the young population. Even how they are packaging <laughs> the drugs these days, do you know, uh, drugs are packaged in the form of candy sometimes, biscuits and chocolates. They are coming up with so many ways of making it attractive to the kind of age group that he's talking about. Okay, so we have those <coughs> drugs, but then we have the drugs that we can get <coughs> over the counter. And, and my question for you is, are our pharmacists trained to be able to pick up signs? Of, so, so the person who is coming and saying, I want this medicine, are you able to, to tell that um, there is a problem? First and foremost, the, the kind of drugs that you get addicted to, you're not supposed to get over the counter. You have to have a valid prescription to show that you know you have a certain ailment or maybe you're managing pain post surgery or something like that and it shows who prescribed that drug from where and why but clearly from last week mm. we can tell that yeah. it's true. possible true it yeah, is possible mm. that's that's the sad fact it's possible to get these drugs but i don't think the people who access these drugs access them over the counter at least not directly they either connive with maybe unscrupulous medical workers because the stats out there show, and, and I hate to say this, but m most of the addicts to prescription meds are actually health workers because they know how this drug acts. They know how to use it and what drugs and what amounts to use it in. And most of all, they have the access. They can come and say, you know, I need this drug for this and this, and you'll believe them because this person knows exactly what they're treating. But if it's a patient coming over the counter and usually an addict, they most likely won't know why they're buying this drug. So they'll give you shady excuses. It's, it's your, yes, pharmacist, to answer your question. Pharmacists and other health workers are trained to look up for these signs. And you know such parts, you know, compulsive behavior when you see it, even just by looking at a person. If they're high and they, are, they really need a fix, you can always tell. And if there's still, if they don't need a fix, then they are still high, which you can also tell. But Marion, you know that we have pharmacies mm. in Uganda. Mm. I told you yes. my story earlier. Yeah. I went and I was able, well, it mm. wasn't that kind of drug. But yeah. um, we know that they're there. Yeah. You can just go. They're not yeah. going to look at me. They won't look at me. They'll just yeah. say, what do you want? Yes. Uh, okay, have this, this amount. Mm. They're not even looking at you. So how are we trying to arrest this? Well, the sad fact is, yes, we can still, ease of access is still a problem. But it's not that there are no laws. The laws are there. Uh, it's chapter 206 of the Uganda laws of, U of, of governing this nation. And yes, it's in enforcement. And the jurisdiction is under the National Drug Authority. So yes, the laws are there. But to the, the extent to which those laws are enforced is still an issue. You'll find in some places the laws are properly enforced and they have books that you know, record all the details of the patient and what they took and why they took it. 
and then in other places you won't find it. That's still a challenge. So maybe it's a policy issue. We need to talk to policy enforcers and see what is the issue here, what do we lack. But yeah, ease of access is still an issue, yeah. Okay, well then back to these other tracks. So I know that in, in schools now, it's a thing that children in school in have access. Mm -hmm. how, how do we start to help that problem? Yeah, I think, uh, like my colleague is saying... Yeah, you uh, find syringes yeah, missing yeah, from the laboratory yeah. and, the, you know... The, the, the very first step should be uh, reducing uh, accessibility. Because when you, when you look at uh, factors that fuel addiction, there are basically three. One is capability, two is opportunity, and three is motivation. When you talk about capability, you have to, you have to be able to get uh, the drugs, and uh, also you have to have... Um, the possibility of being addicted to the drugs because uh, genetically and that's another long story genetically there are some people who are predisposed to be, uh, who are more vulnerable to addiction than others so at the point of capability if you reduce the availability then you are incapacitating many people from 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 accessing the drugs then the opportunities uh, we have so many opportunities where our young people uh, even adults are accessing these drugs. She talked about uh, how we are having uh, our professionals in, fa in the in pharmacy health centers yes. not uh, being able to keep these drugs under key and lock and then hence providing an opportunity then. The other, p the other bit is about motivation. Motivation is about how are these drugs being marketed and then some people are having pain. When they have pain whether it's psychological pain or physical pain, then they try to think of ways of minimizing pain. So they are motivated from the pain point of view. So you have to, to have a holistic approach, a, an approach from the policy point of view, but also an approach from that, uh, individ from that uh, point of view where you can address people at their pain levels. Okay, so, so um, example, you're a yeah. parent or yeah. a teacher, and this yes, is a problem yes, in schools yeah, yeah. now. Yeah. How do you start to yeah. help your children there? How do the teachers uh, start to help the children? One awareness. We have to teach, we have to let our children know about these drugs and the impact that they are likely to have on them. Okay. Yes. And then, but more important than awareness for me is life skills. Because many of them use drugs because of peer pressure, because, they are, because their esteem is low because they, they lack friendship formation or peer resistance skills. So when we teach our young children to love themselves, uh, they will fit in and they will know that if I'm being influenced negatively, I can move out of this what? I can move out of this company. It's not my company. The last point for the parents is always to be there for their children because uh, today we are all too busy. We are all too busy working and our children are not being listened to. So our children are being coached by other children, by, uh, by their peers, who may not really give them the right kind of information. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think just to add to that, um, like we were talking earlier, we can't underestimate the impact that dialogue has. This is a good platform to start. So when you're able to talk about such issues, you make them the community is concerned, they become more concerned and more aware, it becomes a public health issue and then when the louder the noise you make, I mean, the more people will listen. So I think dialogue is also important. It's a starting schools, point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Apostle Kiri. Yeah, I, I will strongly stress that uh, much of these things, uh, this kind of addictions, movement of drugs, uh, the problem is not a school, but the problem is a family because we are got involved uh, with the drugs and literally even my parents never knew. They never knew. They never knew I was in prison. They never knew I came out. They never knew what happened until I told my story. So it is always a problem with the family because once the family has got its grip on the children to teach their children, uh, much of what we are facing today, especially affecting uh, the youth and our children is that our parents, they, they have not even realized their marriages. How their parents, they, either they are having a beautiful marriage, educating their children, the father is on the other side, the mom is on the other side, and uh, the influencer is on the other side on the kid. So you realize that most of the youth have the attention 
of other people than the family itself. Actually, that's what literally affected me. And uh, in this movement, as we talk about drugs, everywhere I go, I emphasize the family has a role to play. Well, how do I identify addiction, maybe in my family or among my circle of friends? You, uh, it is easy to identify addiction because, uh, as I told you to, uh, from the beginning, when somebody is addicted, he has a location. If somebody is addicted to alcohol, he will always be where alcohol is because he needs the supply of it. He can never move away. So addiction brings rebellion. You want to push them to school, they don't want to go to school because there is no supply. So their first element of addiction is rebellion. You become rebellious. They cannot find you where they want to find you because you have to be where the supply is. Are there any telltale signs? So I look at you, you mentioned sweating, Ali, profuse sweating. Is there anything else that you start to look for and you're able to put your finger to it? Yeah. There is loss of weight, loss of memory. Uh, the, the, you lose a desire to eat food. So when you start to see a child is not eating food, you start to question what is happening. Because with addiction, it puts you to drinking a lot. You need to take fruits than food. And most of the time you are dozy. You feel nausea as if you want to doze. From the clinical point of view, of course, he highlights some, some symptoms, which symptoms can also be presented uh, in case of other conditions. So uh, they are important symptoms, but then there are some like really exclusive indicators that we can look for example. at. Yeah, for example, one is uh, when someone has become, uh, when they can't do without something, uh, and, and two, when, uh, when, uh, when they continue using a substance or engaging in a behavior, even when they know that that behavior is going to result into harm. So that, uh, use, of an, uh, that use of participation in an activity, that does, not give, uh, that does not give life in itself. For example, if I'm eating food, I cannot say because I have to eat every day, then I'm addicted to food. No, because food is a life-giving activity. But if I get involved in, a, in an activity that is not really life-giving, and I find myself in a condition that I can't do without it, in spite of the negative consequences, then I know I'm getting addicted. And it's not only with the drugs, but also with other behaviors. But, but that is yeah. for you on the outside. Yeah. For us on the outside, yeah. we want to be able to see and yeah. say, is, yeah. that, uh, is there a problem? so that yeah. we can start looking for help for you? Well, on the outside, the, the first things you'll start to notice is changes in mood and behavior, changes in temperament. Someone who has always been calm is now, you know, has all this energy, they, they want to fight you, they, they, they talk back at you, like some of your guests you had last week. Those are some of the things that you will notice in an addict, first yeah. off. Okay. Yeah. The symptoms, um, sometimes you, you will see the syringes, sometimes you will see the, 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 the wounds, they had fights, they start getting problems with the law, they start uh, getting new friends, they start changing new, uh, places where, they, where they, they relate with people and uh, they start missing out on work, they start neglecting themselves. What kind yeah. of, of counsellors? Yeah. do they need, for example, at yeah. your centers? Yeah. So yeah. Do, you, do you need former addicts? Do you need people yeah. like Apostle yeah. here coming to speak to them? Yeah. Yeah. Do you need people who actually studied this mm. stuff? Is it yeah. people who have never experienced? Yeah. Because I think sometimes you're an yeah. addict, you're thinking, yeah. you've never yeah. been there, you don't understand my struggle. Yeah. So why are you telling me what to do? What kind yeah. of, of people first of help all, in the centers? First of all, from the clinical point of view, let me also uh, correct something that we, we wouldn't want to call them addicts. We want to call them people with substance use disorders. Okay. Yeah, because then that reduces stigma. We want to put people first and then the drug <laughs> or their behaviors after. So mm. we, we normally would need a, a, a multidisciplinary team. First of all, we need medical workers, uh, especially psychiatrists, because uh, when someone gets uh, into into this uh, into this condition, then they they need the detoxification. Then they need to to be to be put on medical therapy for them to 
to regain normal functioning. Okay. Uh, that aside, they also need uh, uh, social workers to work with their families, to work with their friends. They need uh, recovering uh, rec people in recovery, those who used to who are using drugs formally to give to inspire them okay. with their stories. They also need spiritual. They also need spiritual because. Uh, Uganda is a praying country, and uh, when one or another people really subscribe to their spiritual affiliation, so they need mm -hmm. that encouragement, priests, pastors, and imams to work with them. So I would say you need uh, really a very big team to work with, and counselors, of course, to work with. Now, uh, there's some, something that we are not yet doing, but that's uh, called case management, whereby after these people have been treated, you also work with the uh, the tr employment agencies and the training agencies to enroll them back into practice or into education. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you very much. Let's take uh, another short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room. Now, the studio audience has been dying to ask a couple of questions, so we'll, we'll start off with, with you. Please ask your question. Okay, yeah. Apostle Kiria, what did you use to stop taking drugs? Actually, what helped me, I'd already mentioned it, the spirituality, because it's a teamwork. Mm -hmm. I just woke up in the morning and I was tired. I went to church. And I remember when I entered the Miracle Center at that time, uh, Pastor Robert Kayanja prayed for me. He prayed for me, and uh, all of a sudden, by morning, I couldn't wake up. I was just feeling weak, and they put a drips of water on me for, for almost a week. Because my body, because of the addiction, it was draining out every liquid in me. So I was much on water. Within a week, I, I, I never had that addiction until now. But the spirituality is very, very important. Very important. OK. Your question? Uh, I would like to know, is there a breeze point with the drug? Sorry? Is there, is there a bridge point with taking drug, a point of, that, of satisfaction? That yeah. I'm, I've taken enough, mm. I'm, I'm... Yes, you can't continue okay. anymore. In, in, the short, in the short run, it is there. Because that's why they will tell... That's why he said that <coughs> after four hours, I would have something. And then it takes him to his high, where he normally finds his high, and then that's it. But this high keeps on going up and up. Eventually, he ends up needing more and more shots mm. to attain that high until when he overdoses. So if he had to, con to continue with that, the end point would have been overdosing, but also sometimes even before you overdose, the effects, the effects, uh, the psychological, mental effects of the drugs just wear a person away and then they, like, they lose it completely mentally or physically. Mm -hmm. So in one or another, the end point would either be insanity death. or madness or death. Mary? Yeah, I mean, he, he has summarized it in a nutshell. My only answer was going to be death, because, mm -hmm. I mean, there is no bliss point. Even the bliss point is very temporary, mm -hmm. because once your body tolerates that dose, that's it. You need more, and then you need more, and then next time you need more until yep. you either run mad or you, you die. Myself, I would encourage. I would encourage anybody using drugs and you are in that kind of state because I was in that state, but you don't lose all, you get a realization. Because even I've seen so many of them that used to take, that I used to know, you reach a realization and you say, you look at the people who are walking normally, but with you to walk like them, you need a shot. So you reach an, a point where you say, no, I'm tired, I'm tired, I just want to be normal. It happened to me, and that's what pushed me to the church, because I really wanted to be normal. Uh, everything that I had, I was selling it off in order to buy drugs. Mm. I couldn't travel anymore because I was so weak. So you, everyone has the realization. What, what should the friends and the family of a user know? Yeah. Uh, Anyone can start. <laughs> <laughs> the okay, the family, yeah, yeah. actually what happens okay. with the family, yeah. because uh, you had already mentioned it, mm you have a syringe or you are hiding because you take it mm. alone. Either you are in the toilet or the other, you are hiding somewhere. Mm. But you reach a point whereby the family 
has to take strong measures. Mm -hmm. He had already said it. Yeah. You take strong measures against addiction because addiction is, is, is just very difficult for mm -hmm. the addict mm -hmm. to fight. Mm -hmm. He has already succumbed to it. Yeah. So the family has got to be so tough. Involved every force you have, the spiritual force, the governmental force or police or whatever measure. Yeah. and push them to rehabilitation centers without compromise. Okay. Yeah, I would like them to know, first of all, if you have a user in the home, I would like you to know that there is hope. Uh, you could have uh, seen this person trying to come out of it but failing, and you could be tempted to give up. Addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder, but that does not mean that it cannot be arrested. So. Uh, no matter how much someone has tried to abstain and they fall back, just keep supporting them. And good enough in Uganda today, we have various facilities and various professionals, psychiatrists, uh, rehabilitation centers, and hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, that can be able to help. You need also a professional. He's lucky that he, he walked into a church and then he was prayed over and it happened. Not everyone will recover that way. So may, there are different ways of recovery. If you've tried in a church and you are still struggling, go to a rehabilitation center, go to, go to, go and see a counselor, go and find something, someone who can help you, but you can make it. There is hope. All right. Well, yes. Marino, I'll give you the final <coughs> word. You'll close our session for us tonight. <laughs> what would you like to say? Thank you. Um, I think for me, what I would say about all this is that <coughs> it's also important to recognize the underlying cause. You don't just get addicted out of the blue. It's a process. You, you start somewhere, yes, you take a drug, and then you get addicted slowly. So identify the cause. In the younger demographic, it's usually a, a cry for attention. Talk to your child. Find out what's happening. Are they being bullied? Are they you know, having the wrong kind of friends? Are they having peer pressure? Do they want to look cool at school and things like that? So find out what the problem is, and then address that first. And if the child has crossed over, then seek help. Yeah. All right. And you actually mentioned the family Yeah, breakdown. the family plays a major role yeah. into that. Okay. You can never overcome addiction unless there is somebody who cites it. Mm. Someone who cites it does much more work in helping you come out of it. But also we would encourage. There is what they call the, the counteract. Especially if you're using, you are there, you're using cocaine or heroin. There are other drugs that fall in that category because to come out of it may be difficult, but they give you those other drugs that are not so dangerous as those ones, and they go on reducing the doses within a, a given period of time, you fall out of it. But this is with particular help yeah. Yeah. from uh, yes. medical professionals. professionals. Yes. With yes. the professionals. Yes. All right. Well, yeah. thank you very much, yeah. all of you, for taking the time to share with us Thanks about drugs that. and addiction. Okay, well, that's our episode of Perspective with Josephine Karanji this week. Thank you for watching. Remember, there's a repeat every Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. And it's online. Uh, we're live online, and you can also get that on our NTV Uganda YouTube page. From all of us here, good night. Thank you. And NTV Weekend Edition is coming up next.